This is continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. In the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell from the Hidden Killers podcast. Hidden Killers podcast. We're up to segment number two in our continuous coverage in the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. Let's head to the courtroom. Okay. On instruction number 31, then the court is going to take those arguments under advisement. And if any further edits are made to that, changing the instruction will advise counsel and consider the matter submitted. The court will uh, determine whether or not there should be some modification based on the arguments as it relates to paragraph 3 of instruction number 31 and also incorporating that same rationale and the objection made on 29. uh, The court may also consider editing paragraph three of 29 for the same reason that's been raised by the defense. So uh, if it's changed, we'll advise counsel before the final jury instructions are given to the jurors. All right, let's move on then to instruction number 32. The state has no objection. Uh, Mr. Archibald? I do see an edit. I'm going to make counsel on paragraph four that to commit the crimes of, um, we will make that a singular crime. I think that was a carryover from the other conspiracy counts. So in instruction number 32, uh, we previously objected to paragraph 3. The indictment indicates uh, Chad, Daybell, Lori Vallow, and Alex Cox. Uh, Paragraph 3 in this instruction says Lori Vallow, Chad, Daybell, and or Alex Cox. So we believe that uh, this instruction gives uh, more options uh, for conviction as to other than how she was indicted. So the and or language as proposed by the state we believe is not reflective in the indictment. The uh, Indictment contains language as part of a continuing transaction, common scheme or plan. Did willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate. That language is not in, included in instruction number 32. Did combine or conspire to commit murder. That language is not in instruction number 32. So, again, we're concerned that the court is simplifying uh, the matter for the jury in this case, where the the grand jury uh, did have some some additional language. Uh, And we had previously asked for the indictment to be sent back for clarification that request was denied so we think likewise this court should uh, should not in essence grant that at this time okay i've considered those objections and let me hear a response from the state if you would miss blake Thank you, Your Honor. And before I respond, just briefly, in looking at this again on 6B, it appears that it has September with a large I I, or a Roman numeral 1. I don't know if we want to change that to the standard. That would be the number 1? Yes, the number 1. It it was probably put in as a Roman numeral. or. Okay. Um, I think that's a clerical mistake we can correct on 6B to make that September 1. I just didn't want to forget. And then with regard to the response, as the state has previously indicated on that and or, it does comport with the evidence 
submitted in this trial. It comports with also the previous instruction given regarding a conspiracy and that it can be one or more persons. So we do believe that that is an appropriate jury instruction with regard to that and or in response to defense's position that this does not contain all of the language from the indictment, it would be the state's position that this does comport with the Idaho standard criminal jury instruction. In addition, there was mention that it may be oversimplifying. It would be the state's position. Part of jury instructions would be to simplify or make things not confusing for the jurors. And where it does comport with the standard jury instruction and it comports with evidence presented, I think it would be an appropriate, appropriate instruction to be given as written. So for those reasons, the state would ask that it remain as in its current form. All right. I've considered the objections there um, on the and or language as has been previously ruled on the counts one and three conspiracy counts. The court does find that the additional instruction relating to conspiracy would allow for the and or language, although that's not what's in the information, or I'm sorry, the indictment. It does comport with evidence that was presented in the case as well as the uh, laws it relates to ap- applying the law to the facts of this case with the conspiracy definitions. So the objections overruled on that. The paragraph four, the court will take the S off the crimes and make that singular. We'll modify paragraph six B to be a number one instead of a Roman numeral one. To fix that as well. The courts considered the additional objections lodged by the defense on instruction number 32 and will overrule those objections as previously stated on the other conspiracy counts that were argued earlier. Uh, let's next look at instruction number 33. No objection from the state. Uh, from the defense. Yes, we previously objected to jury instruction 33 because the state uh, yesterday asked for their an amended indictment to clarify what type of theft they were seeking uh, because of uh, different code sections were reflected differently in the indictment and and so uh, whether she's charged with intent to deceive or intent to deprive um, those are those are different those are different meanings so uh, basically jury instruction number 33 says it doesn't matter so it doesn't matter why I seek out the amended indictment so that's why we object to instruction number 33 all right response from the state on that Thank you, Your Honor. And this is very similar to jury instruction 27 that we previously discussed regarding that language. The state's position would be, again, that this would be compliant with the Idaho standard criminal jury instructions. It is also contained within the language in the indictment. I know there's been reference back to that amendment made to the indictment multiple times. The amendment was made to correct a clerical error regarding a code section, not the language itself. So it would be reflective of what's in the indictment. Generally speaking, under theft, the theft can be committed by either taking, withholding, or detaining. So the jury instruction just simply indicates that either or any of those could be an option. I don't think that that is in opposition to what has been presented in the indictment and, again, is allowed under the Idaho criminal uh, standard criminal jury instructions. All right, I'm just uh, rereading this instruction. All right, I've considered the argument uh, from the defense on instruction number 33. Um, 
there is some some case law that also talks about jury instructions. Uh, there's a case, State versus Lees. Uh, it's a Idaho Court of Appeals case. I don't have a good site, but it's three six four one six two ten Westlaw nine five eight seven seven eight four. But anyway, it cites two other cases: uh, the Severson case, one forty seven Idaho at seven ten, and talks about instructions that are on the nature and elements of the crime charged and essential legal principles applicable to the evidence that has been admitted. So I think uh, it is within the uh, discretion of the court to allow for instructions that also go towards uh, the nature of the evidence that's been admitted in the case and not only the charging documents. I'll also note that in this instruction, this is specific to count seven, which is the grand theft charge, which was not. Let me review that. I think on that. Was that charge amended as part of the amended information to change the code site? No, Your Honor. That in, within the indictment, I think that one had. Oh, I'm. Just one moment. It does have the two twenty four oh three two a code site. Yes, I'm looking at the amended indictment as if it were the original. So I apologize, Your Honor. I was double checking that it was amended. But I would note the language in there has always contained the by deceit with intent to deprive another. And then it goes on to eventually say wrongfully take, obtain, or withhold. And I believe that that is indicative of the same language within the jury instruction. All right. Well, having considered that in the language of the indictment, the court finds that instruction 33 is a proper and standard jury instruction also from the Idaho criminal jury instructions and would apply given the evidence that's been admitted in this case to help instruct the jury to appropriately apply the law to the facts of this case. So instruction number 33 will be given. Let's next look at instruction number 34. The state has no objection, Your Honor. All right, from the defense. Instruction number 34 uh, does not contain the same language as the indictment from the grand jury regarding the elements of grand theft. All right, what's the response from the state? Your Honor, the state's position is this would conform with the evidence that was presented at trial, at trial, and it also conforms with the Idaho standard criminal jury instructions. In looking at it, again, it does have that common scheme or plan language that, again, as the state had indicated, dealt with the venue issue, which is a preliminary matter, and we believe that the language in what's charged does comport with what is in the jury instruction, although it may have different language that it comports. On this 
instruction, the court uh, did review the language of the amended indictment as well as the standard jury instruction, which was uh, federal criminal jury instruction 543, and went through to make sure that all of the appropriate elements of that offense are contained in the instruction. Uh, it's the way the statutes set it out for the theft statutes. They're kind of mixed in between the types of theft, theft by deception, and then you have to go to the definition ses uh, section above that also. Uh, and so looking through that, the standard instruction 543 pulls those things together to cover the elements. So because this is based on the 543 instruction and having confirmed the language in the indictment, the court does find that the instruction properly instructs the jurors as to both the elements of the offense as well as uh, comports with the evidence that's been admitted in the case for the jury to consider. So considering all that, the court will overrule the objection of the defense and jury instruction number 34 will be provided. Let's next look at instruction number 35. The state has no objection. Uh, well, well, and we can the discuss, there is also a, this gets to the verdict form. Um, so once this is completed, we'll include a printed, well, we'll include the content of the verdict form will be part of instruction 35, but of course there will only be a single verdict form that will be provided to the jurors for the presiding officer to sign. Um, the court did submit a proposed copy of a verdict form, so since we're on this instruction now with a that would contain the sample verdict, if you have any comments relating to the proposed verdict form, let's take those up along with instruction number 35. So starting with the state, do you have any comments on the verdict form? Yes, Your Honor. With regard to question number two, we would propose that the and grand theft by deception with the question uh, and grand theft by deception be removed. And with regard to question number four, similarly, we would request that and grand theft by deception be removed on that one. And then same on question number five, that and grand theft by deception be removed. I believe those are the only proposed changes by the state. All right, and then for the contents of instruction 35, any objections to the way that reads, uh, sort of the verdict form? No objection to the way the instruction reads. All right, and looking at, I'll, I'll hear from the defense here in a minute, but that does need to be corrected. The grand theft by deception language that's not part of the charges uh, will be removed on those verdict forms. We'll get another proposed verdict form to you before it's provided to the the jurors uh, in the morning and make those amendments on that verdict form. Uh, let me hear from the defense now, uh, noting those changes that will be made on the verdict form to comport with the charging language of the indictment. Do you have any comments, Mr. Archibald? In in the questions it asks, is she guilty or not guilty? And then the, the check of the boxes is not guilty or guilty. So those kind of seem you know, backwards if they're going to be consistent. Uh, so that's all I'd note in question, well, all six questions. The question is, is she guilty or not guilty? But then when you check the boxes, it says not guilty or guilty, so it's just switched. So uh, we'd ask that the questions uh, say not guilty or guilty to be consistent with the boxes that they check. Okay. We're going to redraft the 
verdict form will take out those. Uh, I, I agree it makes sense to have some uniformity between how the language reads versus the options below. So we'll incorporate those changes as well. Uh, we'll get you a proposed revised verdict form uh, by the end of today. And if you have any further questions on it, I'll allow any comments on that before the jurors are brought in and provided the final instructions uh, tomorrow morning. And then we also had a question about accessory after the fact. Okay. I'll take that up. Uh, let's finish the last couple of instructions, and then we can go to your proposed accessory instruction. <coughs> so 36 is a standard instruction I believe council agreed to yesterday. Is there any objection on 36? Not from the state, Your Honor. Thank you. From the defense? No. No objection. Okay, 36 will be provided. 37 is a instruction about exhibits and any objection on the way that's written now from the state? No objection from the state, Your Honor. Any objection from the defense on 37? No objection. All right, that will be provided. Jury instruction 38 is an instruction for the jurors to select a presiding officer. It's a standard instruction. Any objection from the state? No objection from the state. All right. From the defense, any objection? No objection. That will be provided. And then finally, the uh, final instruction on 39 on uh, deliberations and how those are done is from the standard instruction. Any response on 39 from the state? No objection from the state. For the defense? No objection. All right. So the next issue we'll take up then as it relates to a proposal that the uh, court include an accessory instruction in this case. Um, Mr. Archibald, I haven't seen a proposed instruction, but you've argued uh, for one that was, I think it's the instruction number 310 of the criminal jury instructions you wanted? Yes. Uh, I know criminal jury instruction 310 uh, is a reflection of Idaho Code section 18-205. A person who knows a felony was committed and willfully conceals it from a peace officer is guilty as an accessory. So there has been uh, evidence submitted during this case uh, that a reasonable uh, jury could conclude that that if she's not guilty of murder, she's certainly guilty of knowing a felony was committed and lied about it to police. And so the accessory... Uh, charge here, uh, even though she's not charged with accessory, we believe it's a reasonable interpretation uh, for the jury to consider that rather than if they, if they do not convict her on murder. All right, so if the instruction were given as to which counts would you request that would apply to? I think it would apply to all of them, except the grand theft. Uh, so count one, if, if the jury believes, well, she didn't kill anybody, but she certainly lied about it. Um, I think that would apply to counts one, two, three, four, and five. And then count seven, uh, the grand theft so, uh, of Social Security funds probably would not apply to that, but it would ap apply to uh, counts one through five. All right. Uh, I'd like to hear some response then from the state on whether or not an instruction 
in conformity with criminal jury instruction 310 would be appropriate in the case. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the state's position is that it would not be appropriate. Essentially, it's being requested as a lesser included offense instruction for several of the counts here. In looking at Rome v. State 164 Idaho 407, that's an Idaho Supreme Court case from 2018, when we look at the language in that, it's a little bit different of specifically what was being determined. In that one, they were attempting to include accessory after the fact as a lesser included of an aiding and abetting, but that would lead into a jury instruction providing that you don't consider the differences necessarily between aiding and abetting and principles with certain things. But the bigger part of it, I think, and what we would indicate is that one offense is not considered a lesser included of another unless it is necessarily so under the statutory definition of the crime. And further, an offense will be deemed to be a lesser included offense of another greater offense if all the elements required to sustain a conviction of the lesser included offense are included within the elements needed to sustain a conviction of the greater offense. As a result, an offense is not a lesser included if it is possible to commit the greater offense without committing the lesser offense. And when we look at accessories defined and specifically the Idaho Code 18205, all persons or accessories who having knowledge that a felony has been committed willfully withhold or conceal it from a peace officer, judge, magistrate, grand jury, or trial jury. In no way are those elements required to prove conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft. They're not required to prove conspiracy to commit murder, or they're not contained within those elements, and they are not required for grand theft, which I think the defense has recognized that, and they are not required to prove first-degree murder, and especially under the theory of a principle, in no way is there an element that a person having knowledge withhold or conceal that as a requirement to prove one of the greater offenses. So if we follow the rationale of the Idaho Supreme Court in Rome v. State, accessory after the fact would not be an appropriate lesser included So to include that instruction would only confuse the jury. In addition, when we look at 310, there's actually a comment there indicating that it shouldn't just stand alone without more. And if I may have just one moment. Yes. So given, again, looking at that standard jury instruction in conjunction with the 18205, Idaho Code 18205 that it mirrors, and then looking at the case law from the Idaho Supreme Court, it simply is not an appropriate jury instruction and would only lead to confuse the issues and confuse the jury because it is not an appropriate lesser included offense. So for those reasons, we would request that the court deny the defense request to have that jury instruction added. All right, any response from the defense before I make a ruling on this proposed instruction? No, Your Honor. All right, the courts uh, considered the defense request to include the accessory instruction. As noted, it wouldn't apply uh, to the count seven grand theft charge because that uh, charge is only as against the defendant here. The accessory instruction talks about uh, another person, so it talks about the other the person charged. If you willfully conceal, a, a, it says a person who knows a felony was committed and willfully conceals it and protects or protects the person charged is guilty as an accessory. Uh, I've considered the argument by the state for the rationale stated in Rome versus state about whether or not it's an appropriate lesser included offense and considering the evidence that's been presented as well as uh, the in this case the just the evidence by the case in chief and there wasn't a defense case put on 
uh, other than through cross-examination. I've considered that. Looking at the elements charged in those conspiracy counts and the murder counts, um, also the court has to consider that with the conspiracy charges and the way the conspiracy law is defined where someone can join a conspiracy later, uh, the accessory instruction, I think, would not be applicable when the conspiracy charges have been charged on counts one, uh, I think it's one, three, and five. I'll also note the evidence um, in this case was that the defendant was part of the conspiracy from the time before any of these alleged acts were committed. There wasn't any direct evidence that there was no knowledge of this um, before the alleged acts that are charged in counts one, counts three, and five for the conspiracy charges. So I'd find it would be an inappropriate instruction for those. And then also as it relates to the other charges, um, two and four for the murder charges, again, uh, the evidence would have to support for the jurors to find that there was one, um, some knowledge of the defendant, and I don't really recall any evidence uh, directly relating to any express knowledge. There's circumstantial evidence, but um, that would indicate that knowledge only would have occurred after the fact, so the, all the allegations were the knowledge occurred before and after. And looking at that as well as the elements of conspiracy and, again, the comment in the instruction under 310, which cites the State versus Teasley case and also the Rome versus State case the State has cited to, I think that it would be an instruction that would not properly advise the jurors of uh, the evidence that's been here as it relates to the charges as well as I think it would potentially confuse the jurors as well. So the court is going to deny, based on the evidence that was presented in trial, the defense request for an accessory instruction, and the court determined that would not be appropriate here for those reasons then. We're not going to allow for the accessory instruction as either a freestanding option or to be in combination with the charges in the case. So that'll be the ruling on that request. <coughs> Council, we do have a, a new proposed verdict form that's ready to be reviewed. Why don't we take a quick recess maybe for just five or ten minutes and then we can come back on the record and go back to the verdict form. I'll get a copy provided to you and then we can determine whether that's sufficient. All rise. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallo. We took a recess while we redrafted the proposed verdict form. I just wanted to go through that issue again before we conclude. So that would relate to our jury instruction number 35, which would contain uh, within that instruction a content of this proposed form. So has the state seen the revised verdict form now? Yes, Your Honor. Does the state have any comments uh, on the verdict form or approve the verdict form as it's now written? We approve the verdict form as written. All right. Has the defense been able to review that? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Does the defense have any comment on the verdict form or any suggested further edits? You know, just reading the verdict form, it sure seems like uh, 
question number six is pretty similar to question one and three, uh, where it where it where they all contain the same charge of grand theft. All right, the counts are as set forth in the information, and I'm sorry, in the indictment. So six is a question as it relates to count seven of the indictment, which is the grand theft charge. So that, yeah, that's my only obs observation. I realize that's how they charged it. All right. Understood. So, um, counsel, the court will intend to provide that as incorporated in that instruction 35. If there's any other revisions or rulings, the court will put up those on the record in the morning before our closing arguments. The court also will, um, before the jury comes in, plan on uh, finalizing the ruling on the criminal rule 29 motion that was argued and taken under advisement. And then we will, uh, assuming that uh, allows us to move forward with closings. If so, then we'll have closings starting tomorrow morning. Is there anything else we need to bring up? This uh, One other point, actually, I wanted to mention, Council. On the information, which will be the amended... I'm sorry, I keep saying information, but it's the indictment. On the amended indictment, uh, the jurors have not had a copy of that previously provided. They've been read from it in the instructions, but they will in deliberations have a copy of that. The court would intend to redact out the count uh, counts 6 and 8 and 9 that relate only to Chad Daybell and the defendant's not charged with. I think just leaving those in there may create some unnecessary confusion for jurors since those counts are not being considered. I'd like to hear if there's any comment on that plan to redact those uncharged counts as against this defendant from the amended indictment before it's provided to the jurors. Your Honor, the state wouldn't have an objection to that. I guess the only thing that I would indicate is I'm not sure if those are going to show as redacted or if the court is considering renumbering the indictment counts in order to match up with the questions because the verdict form will have a different number associated with it than the indictment will by redacting out those counts. So that would be the only concern at all is if we could agree to potentially modify that for purposes of handing it to the jury, just those count numbers to match up with the question numbers. Yeah, um, in thinking through that, I think what we would do is simply, you know, physically redact a copy of the indictment by removing that with a notation so the jurors understand it was redacted by the court so they don't wonder why that's blacked off of their the counts would remain the same as they are in the instructions and as they are in the indictment um, so it would track with what we've already put together. Um, so I think that would alleviate that concern. Does the defense have any objection to the redaction of the Chad Daybell counts in the indictment? Would the court also delete his name from the indictment in the title? And, Your Honor, if the court could be heard on that, if the court is considering that. Yeah, go ahead. I think that would only confuse the issue and confuse the jurors because then they're going to see missing counts and wonder why. I think with his name on there, they may be able to piece it together easier. So if we're going to modify the indictment that much, I wonder if it wouldn't be cleaner than to just have an amended indictment approved for handing to the jury where we only have her name and then we number the counts to match up with the questions. Because as it is now, the the counts won't completely match up with the questions on the verdict form, which I think could be confusing. And then if we take his name off and we just have blanked out spaces. Well, I don't, I don't 
think there's going to be any change of the numbering if we're, we're just blocking off what's already in the indictment. So, But I believe we'd be taking off count six. And so if we take off count six, then question six will actually end up referring to count seven in the indictment. And, and that's I don't know. It, but that's the way it's written in the verdict form. It says in regards to count seven of the indictment. It just said question six, though. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that was the only concern. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure the verdict form corresponds as well as the counts in the jury instructions to what's just in the indictment. Um, that suggestion by the defense to remove the name also uh, on the caption, I think, is a well-taken point to avoid any further confusion. Obviously, the name uh, would remain in there that because the, the case being tried is not his case. And so I think it should be removed just from that part of the caption. However, his name would remain in, like, the preliminary statement before count one and other counts that are charged, so the conspiracies under count one, uh, his name within the other counts, two and three. So I do think for purposes of clarifying the record that coming off of the caption there is also appropriate. So the court will get for counsel a copy of that redacted indictment and have that submitted to you before it's provided to the jurors also before uh, we start with argument tomorrow morning. All right, counsel, thanks for your time. Is there anything else we need to bring up then this afternoon from the state? Not from the state, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anything from the defense? No, Your Honor. Okay, thanks. We'll be in recess till tomorrow morning. That wraps up segment number two in our continuous coverage of the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. There is more to come. Press subscribe wherever you download podcasts so you don't miss any of it. I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. This is continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. In the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell from the Hidden Killers podcast. Hidden Killers podcast.